Maybe you rush to the parking lot tonight. John, did you want to ask some of those questions about those line items now while we're waiting for the mayor? Yeah, that'd be fine. All right. He's got yes. some line item questions. Yeah, I just have like four or five. Yeah. And then All right, well, I guess we'll open the meeting up. So I call the meeting to order of the budget session. Mr. Olympia, do you have any questions? Yes, through the chair. Dr. Levine, uh, I was reviewing the, uh, the budget spreadsheets, and I just had a few questions on just some of the variances. And on the green-coded uh, spreadsheet, page number 10, line 381, I saw there was an increase of custodial there of 44961 it's probably an increase in one custodian. Might be uh, online because of the uh, Higgins Middle School. Um, I'm not really sure where that is. Is that the Higgins? There's an additional custodian because we went from uh, two FTEs to three FTEs, so we've got an additional position in there. Okay. Okay. And then okay. line 404, there was a decrease of about. Uh, it was 26,929 for special ed transportation monitors, a decrease. Did we spend? He, he projects um, every year what transportation is going to look like in special education. Um, he may be projecting that we're going to need fewer transportation monitors next year than we needed this year. This year we, we had an extraordinary number. Uh, next year we are aging out a number of our out of placement uh, kids. Okay. It's going to save us actually some money. Sure. So uh, with that comes uh, fewer needs of transportation, which means fewer needs of transportation monitors. Those are, that's a, uh, uh, a living um, number. And as we go through the year, um, it's quite easy to add if we need to because it's mandated by law. Okay. So if, if an IEP, for example, changes and we have more kids out than we think uh, that need transportation with monitors, we simply add them. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, line, let's see, line 462, attendance clerical, is that just another, we're adding, there was an increase of $24,000. 194. Is that just we're adding another position? I'm gonna I'm gonna mm -hmm. guess half, that half a position. That that's a half a, a half a position. Okay. Okay. And then let's see. Then with the I believe the Higgins. Uh, let's see, there's a line. By the way, I think that's central office, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. With the Higgins budget, or just something that just jumped out at me, um, line 196, just teaching, page. Uh, page 9. There was a variance of $28,930, you know, an increase uh, under Higgins general teaching supplies. I mean, it's just newer school, bigger, more supplies. Is that yeah, I've heard. It, it could be a variety of things. The principal's here. He may be able to speak to that better than I. I don't really get into discussions about supplies. Okay. I leave that to the principals. Okay. Todd? <coughs> I, have, I just see the number in front of you. Yeah, it was 28. No, I don't know if I could see the lines. Okay. Yeah, Todd, you want the front? Yeah. Basically, in the middle of the. Oh yeah, I, uh, no, sorry. yeah. We took a lot of money, or um, I moved some money from the Higgins equipment line to the general teaching supplies line because going into a new building, we will not need to make the equipment purchases that we normally make right. uh, in any other year. So I moved that into supplies, knowing that moving into a new building, we will need to make supply purchases that we don't normally okay. make in a regular year. So that's okay. definitely. Great, thank you. And then under line uh, 243, uh, page 10, and it's under the high school, uh, two, 243. Oh, I see. That's on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, I mean, just textbooks, 
uh, it's a decrease of 86,840. That's just because the previous year we must have purchased a bunch of new tax books. Correct. And we're probably going to be down over the last couple of years almost 300 students at the high school. Um, okay. I, I, I was looking at the numbers today. Okay. When we open in September, uh, between the last time I looked at it a few years ago and now, uh, it's going to be about a 300 student decrease. Okay. And let's see. Just under the utilities, under line 423, telephone utilities, a decrease of 50,575. Um, Actually, Chris, do you know anything about that? All I knew about that line, and that's one we inherited with the phone system, um, and we just really got familiar with it this year during budget time. It was, I believe, a two hundred and five thousand dollars line. Yes. And I think what's coming out of there is probably the equipment that we won't be covering for the Higgins next year. They're purchasing the copiers as part of the project. And so Through the project. Okay. So the money that's coming out of there, I'm assuming, is um, money that was put towards copiers at the at the existing Higgins. Okay. Five weeks copiers that we're not going to be accounted for. Mm -hmm. All right, great. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay, John. Um, with that, for the chair, uh, I made some tweaks based upon your discussion. Oh, yes. I just have one follow up to uh, Mr. Olympia's question regarding the custodian. Custodians basically go by square footage, correct? Yeah. How many custodians by square footage of the building? Yeah, I, you could. That's one way to do it. Yeah. At least that's I. In the past, I know that's what Mr. Kinnison would always say. Typically, square, square footage of the yep. building times yep. usage kind of ends up with a math formula to custodian needs. So, with that said, you're looking at adding a custodian at the Higgins. I'm not sure it's at the Higgins. I'll have to check that. Okay. Um, that's a question that I don't have the answer right. to. So if you could just get back to me on where that is. Yeah. Because my question would be, you're actually decreasing the square footage at the Higgins. So I, I, I was questioning the need of a new custodial position at the Higgins. I actually don't think it's at the Higgins. I think okay. the Higgins is staying stable um, because uh, not only uh, not only is the square footage decreased somewhat, but the newness of the building uh, had, puts fewer demands on. However, uh, however, there are some other demands that that um, some of our people will be doing down there with the technical aspect of things that they haven't been dealing with True. before, uh, and they'll be doing a lot of professional development regarding those uh, mm -hmm. uh, regarding technology in the machinery that they'll be using. Um, I don't know where that custodian's going, but I'll find out. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so based upon your discussions um, at the first budget meeting, I did make some tweaks to this budget, which I did send you uh, last week. Um, I just want to go through it quickly and then uh, open it up to, uh, to you folks, if you would. Uh, this basically remains the same, uh, with one exception. Um, I. You can see that I ignored the May as 1.75 million and went to 1.825, uh, asking for another $75,000, which is peanuts in a $70 million budget. Um, in all seriousness, that $75,000 that the mayor could see his way uh, uh, through to give us that money uh, would pay for one of the proposed increases um, as we get to it in the next few pages. Uh, and that was that proposed increase is really based upon um, your discussion at the table from the last time we talked. Okay. Um, this pretty much remains the same. Next. What I did here was I added, based upon your discussion, another substance abuse counselor, which means that we would be adding two full time substance abuse counselors instead of one. I'm sorry. Not, not substance abuse counselors, I'm sorry. School adjustment counselors. I'm sorry. School adjustment counselors. We would be adding two school adjustment counselors instead of one. Uh, one would be paid for by, again, the restructuring of the Eagles program. The other would be paid for by regular budget. Um, that is the extra money uh, that I'm asking for, really, from the uh, mayor. I also added a social worker at the Welch. Uh, this came from the B list. I think it's an important position. Uh, of course, the school committee could direct me to turn that social worker into another school adjustment counselor because 
you did want to um, fund as many school adjustment councils as possible. Uh, I do think, though, that uh, there is great evidence that a full-time social worker at the Welch uh, is uh, going to be well uh, placed if you decide to fund that. Um, we just have uh, uh, families that need an awful lot of help and uh, they do come and they ask for it at the Welch. It's one of the schools that families reach out to the school um, for family type help and we don't have enough counseling help uh, to service all of the people that we need to service there. So I am recommending that we do one and one. Um, if you direct me, uh, we will replace the social worker with another school adjustment counselor. Um, but I believe that that's a good list now um, based upon your discussion. Uh, again, the substance abuse counselor uh, will be paid for by the clinic uh, and the reimbursements. Uh, we, we've had some very productive discussions with everybody involved. Um, we have signed off on a letter uh, to the DA. The DA has uh, confirmed the funding uh, to redo uh, that room. Uh, we're well on our way to uh, having a substance abuse counselor there next year in an appropriate place uh, that will really help service our kids next year um, in, in this area. And I think this is a great addition and it's really no cost to the school district uh, because this will be paid for by two extraneous um, financial contributions uh, and we're very, very thankful of that. Okay. Um, uh, none of the rest of uh, the B list uh, has been moved. However, I will tell you that I did go through all of the class sizes today in all of the schools, all of the uh, open enrollments, and all of the school choices. I believe that there are at least two and maybe three teachers internally uh, that would be able to be moved out of their present positions at the elementary schools and into positions um, that we will need that might uh, uh, explode uh, population-wise at different schools. We may not need, in other words, to add uh, teachers with new money. I do, however, uh, suggest strongly that you allow me what you will see as a 200 and some odd thousand dollar buffer um, as we go into the summer for teachers and paraprofessionals. Uh, the need always arises in the summer somewhere um, I do think that we have some good news that, that I saw through the class size numbers, but that can change pretty rapidly in this city. Um, so I would ask you to maintain that buffer that I've built in. Okay. Uh, the C list remains the same. I have added uh, the offsets basically remains the same except uh, I have uh, put in the 1.825 request to the mayor uh, for his number instead of the 175. Okay. The uh, uh, capital improvement remains the same. And I've put this in as a new uh, sheet. It's basically a summary sheet. So the new proposed budget with the 1.825 would be $70,286,793. The incurred debt and additions uh, would now be $3.28 million. Uh, minus the offsets that I built into the budget of $3.49 million would leave a total expenditure against the new proposed budget of $70,793,000 or a $210,000 uh, surplus to meet the needs of the school system over the summer. And I will remind you that <coughs> that $210,000 surplus assumes that everything good happens next year to our benefit. Uh, any baubles, um, we will uh, be in negative territory very quickly. But at least there's something um, so that the first time that we need an additional teacher or, or paraprofessional, we don't have to dig into uh, negative territory. We have at least some buffer there. That's it, kids. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levine. And um, I just have a few words before we... Uh, open it up to counselor uh, to member questions. Uh, first, I wanted to apologize uh, for being a few minutes late. As always, uh, my days never go quite as planned, and uh, um, I apologize. I feel like I'm 15, 10, 15 minutes late for everything in my life. But um, a couple things I do want to mention in terms of scheduling. Uh, we had a meeting today with Tim Spanos, the city clerk, conversation with Dave Gravel, who's the finance chair. 
um, and Mike Ingress. We're targeting uh, the budget to be presented uh, and received on June 9th. Uh, that means that we have to get the budget to Tim Spanos by June 3rd. June 9th will be received by the council and marked up for hearing. Uh, the city side of the budget will be marked up for June 15th. The school side, June 22nd. And then the adoption of the budget, hopefully on June 23rd. Uh, just to kind of give you some of those dates. Uh, not only is June, 20, June 22nd obviously very important, that's when the school budget would be presented, but June 23rd is, is important as well because uh, the final budget will be adopted, but also uh, we are trying to put forward and targeting the capital request date as well. And as I discussed with, at the last meeting, I won't go into all the different items uh, that I'm putting forward, but uh, there's a significant amount of capital uh, that's coming from the school side, uh, technology, the science curriculum, uh, also some work to the high school um, that is all included in that. And I'd love to have the support from all of you there as well when I present to the council uh, that evening. Uh, so that's kind of where we stand in terms of timing. Uh, I know we have to meet some certain dates on our end, but uh, that's kind of uh, the schedule that I'd like to set for us um, to try to get this final budget to the city clerk uh, by June 3rd uh, to meet those timelines. Through the mayor. Yes. Uh, just before you start discussing, um, I did ask Todd to be here uh, so that he could further explain if there were still questions uh, regarding the culinary teacher and the VAC. Um, I forget what that stands for all the time, but we'll just call it a VAC. Um, and I did ask the techie boys to be here um, to explain any technology uh, issues that did come up uh, the last time that I wasn't totally clear on, uh, they, they will be answered, uh, able to answer those questions as well. Great. Um, Scott, I'll turn it over to you. On scheduling, yes. I, I was writing down the dates as you went through them. So I know we have to post and have our public hearing, and I believe we need 10 days. Is it 10 days? We have to have our public hearing. So I wasn't you, sure. Yeah. What did you say for June 3rd? To, for it to be on the agenda for June 9th, we need to get it to Tim Spanos. Uh, the Friday before the meeting. So that would be Friday, June 3rd, to get it to Tim so they can be put to, in the packet to be received by the council on June 9th. So if that's the case, and we have to we have to have our public hearing, if it's 10 days, uh, we need to finish in the next two days. If we need, so we need 10 days in between? I can't remember if it's 10 or not. I'm looking it up. Are you looking it up? Yeah. Well, she's looking at on the, yeah, yeah. On, on the same topic. Yeah. Um, do we have to have, when do the city councilors get our budget? Do they get, do they get sent out that Friday before? They get sent the out that Friday. So okay. they would receive it on the 3rd. The hearing or the uh, council meeting would be the 9th. All they do at that time is receive it and mark it up for uh, finance committee of the whole. That's what, what was being proposed by Councilor Gravel. Uh, President McGinn was to have city side on the Wednesday the 15th, school side Wednesday the 22nd, with final adoption Thursday the 23rd. Do you remember, Karen? I think it is 10 days. It is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. we, have, um, we have to post it and then uh, publish. Not, I'm sorry. We have a seven day publication done. Seven. So, all right, so, uh, so we should check on that 10 days to see if it's in the child. Business days, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Business days. Nine. You got to skip the 30th. Yeah. That's in the Memorial. So we resolve the budget tonight, and then what? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we might be able to. Yeah. <laughs> and then post for the public hearing, and then we can go. Okay. Yeah, because we can, we can post a public hearing, and we can we can still, we can still work, we can work, still on, work on, on it. We can still work on it because you only have to provide a copy of the budget for, uh, within forty eight hours of the public hearing for people to review it. And the members of the public to review it, so you can you can pick a day, and that's you know that's your drop dead date, and then keep working on it if you if you need. 
Okay. So yeah, I figured we'd have to work backwards and figure out our dates on the school committee yet, but I just wanted to kind of give you the uh, the timeline that the council and Tim Spanos would like to see us adopt. So then we would ask uh, Marge to post the public hearing on our end for. Would that be June first? Did you say forty-eight hours? Yeah June, yeah, June 3rd is a Friday, isn't it? June 1st is a Wednesday. Friday. June 3rd is a Friday. So if we had our public hearing, um, yeah, because then that Monday is Memorial Day. Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, convocation is Thursday the 2nd. Mm -hmm. So I think Wednesday, the first the Wednesday, 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 June 1st, Wednesday, June 1st, have the public hearing. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. like union meeting. We can Work, uh, science fair is that evening at the uh, high school. Oh. That's usually a quick event that starts at 7. We wanted to have it maybe. Actually, I would, I would recommend, I'm sorry, to the chair, that we have public hearing at 6 mm -hmm. because it usually takes. Yeah. At the uh, high school at 6? Either yeah. at the high school or here or wherever. But well, if it, yeah. I mean, the high school is fine. Yeah, if we did the public hearing at the high school in the library, and what time is the science fair? Seven. Seven. That works. Okay. That would work. Okay. All right, why don't we target that? We'll ask Marge to send out public no uh, notice for the public hearing on the school budget for Wednesday, June 1st at the high school library at 6 o'clock. Very good. Got it. Okay. Okay. Through the chair to the chair. So does that mean you're very comfortable with the 1.8? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that question might be <laughs> Well, we're well, looking to expedite this rather quickly. Well, let's leave it at 1.75 and see how we do. Yeah. <laughs> but as, as, as all of you know, I, I, I always want to try to be in a position I know uh, while we work together. Um, we want to make improvements and keep making additions, so um, I'm very happy to put forward a number to kind of keep us moving in the right direction. We can never do everything that we want, of course, um, you know, some, there are some limitations certainly, but um, I feel like we've made good investments every year and a lot of confidence in this group. Uh, certainly I, I would have some little changes that I would make in terms of the A list, B list, C list, um, really only one change actually that I would make. Um, but. Uh, I think this is a, you know, a lot of outstanding work put in by our superintendent and his team, and I appreciate that. And uh, open it up to the members for comments, questions. Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Um, through the chair, Dr. Levine, the social social worker at the Welch. Um, you are correct in in saying that. I know I would prefer to have a an additional school adjustment counselor. Um, my feeling is we're not supplying students with what they need at this point. Um, I do realize that as a whole, the family needs to be taken care of as well. But we're not, we're not supplying the children's needs right now. So I would uh, rather have another school adjustment counselor. Um, I would suspect possibly school adjustments counselors can refer out to families through their insurance or through any other state means to get a social worker for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of avenues that they can take, I believe. But I think the school adjustment counselors would be a little bit more needed, in my opinion. Um, and then the, um, I did notice that Mr. Busey was here, and I'm just wondering, is, is he going to, is he, was he here to talk about the building access attendant? Well, that and I, through the chair, um, I believe that the issue of the culinary teacher came up as well at the okay. table. Uh, just if I may respond to uh, Mrs. Carpenter, I believe that you're, you're correct, and I think that there would be um, unintended positive consequences by adding a, uh, the, the school adjustment counselors even in place of the social worker, because the more school adjustment counseling help you get, you're absolutely right, the more um, ability there is for us to refer people to the right places uh, for family help as well. So 
You know, for me, uh, it's not something I fall on my sword for. The difference between a social worker and another school adjustment counselor, the fact that we're talking about being able to add those positions is, is a terrific thing, and I think it's a, uh, um, uh, a testament to the importance that the mayor puts on um, uh, education and uh, uh, just being able to have enough um, to talk about uh, these kinds of positions is, uh, is a terrific thing. And I do appreciate you listing it, and um, you know I do recognize the need, and it is something that in the past we've never been able to talk about these type of positions. So um, I do appreciate it. I'm all set. Any, any other comments, from Mr. Rosigan? Just on, uh, just to follow up on, on Ms. Carpenter's points, have you talked to the principal as far as the social worker versus the school adjustment counselor at that building? Not versus the school adjustment counselor, but she very much would like a social worker. It was one of the things that we talked about when I met with each principal individually. Um, she was uh, uh, very much uh, emphasized the need for her particular community um, for the need for a social worker. Now, I don't think that she would uh, look badly on the addition of a school adjustment counselor um, in place of a social worker since she would be getting um, a significant piece of that anyway. So um, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, the principals would do anything but applaud the list regardless of which way it went. And the other two school adjustment counselors that are listed on list A, they would be going where? Well, we would shuffle the deck. You know, we'd, we would take a look then at what we had and what we needed. Almost every school then, if, if the social worker um, if the school adjustment council was substituted for the social worker, yep. um, we would cover nearly every school full time. We'd be pretty close. Thank you. You're welcome. This is done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for bringing, bringing this forward. My question about um, the social worker, and I think, it's a, I think it's a wonderful idea. I really do think it's something that's needed at the Welch as well as other schools. Could we inquire at um, Salem State at their School of Social Work or at any of the local colleges with the Schools of Social Work? Many of the students there need internships. They need, they need significant hours. I don't know what the supervisory requirements are for social work, but if we could look into that to see if uh, students would be able to serve and work in the district to get the experience. They really need the experience, and we need someone who can do social work because a social worker is going to cut through and navigate the red tape for the people who are involved with so many different agencies. It, it, that's my understanding with the social worker. It's a, through the chair. Um, it's a. I would certainly uh, uh, take a look at that and uh, talk to Salem State. My guess is that they would have to work. The interns would have to work. Uh, directly under a licensed social worker, mm -hmm. which we would not have available unless uh, there's, there's one at the high school, one uh, the high the, school. in the clinic, one the and there might be one at the, so the person doesn't necessarily have to be on site all the time, um, but has to be available, and we have to be very careful about interns being on their own at a school, for example, and, and giving advice in very sensitive areas without direct social work supervision. So um, I would be a little bit hesitant to do that. Um, if we had a social worker on site, you know, the bond door is open for interns. Um, but I'd be just a little hesitant to do that without direct supervision because of the sensitive, think, sensitive nature of the information um, that's discussed. Right, and I think they're, they're found they have to have a supervision close by. So I don't know, many of our staff have numerous certifications. We'll take a look. If we, if we could, it might be a, a, a step forward because um, there's also an initiative, I read about it today from um, Governor Baker. It, is in, it was in a discussion about homelessness and how they, they're already reducing the number of families living in um, motels. And one of the goals of his administration is to uh, increase the number of social workers who are working with families to take care of all of the issues that lead to homelessness. 
and they're finding that many of the people who are homeless are also involved with all these other different agencies, which is, we do have people who are homeless who live in the Welsh School District. They are covered at the shelters that they, that they live at, um, and they have social workers who work with those folks. But if the initiative from the administration in Boston is to get more social workers into the field to help with a lot of the social issues that people are facing, this might be something where they may look at our school district and think that it would help if they if they assigned a social worker. It may, it's just a shot in the dark. Worth looking into. It, it might Absolutely. help because these are the people that um, the state wants to help and. They could do it right at our building, mm -hmm. so it might be might be a possibility too. Absolutely, I'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Hartman. Thank you. <coughs> um, to that point, great point, Mr. Um, uh, through the just a point of information, we do have a. I did have an opportunity to tour the West Therapeutic Program yesterday, along with um, Will and and uh, co-chairs of the special education pack and we do have a licensed social worker there who does have interns. Um, she has a relationship with both Salem State and Boston University and there are interns working um, in the West right now. So if, if that's the case, um, I might lean towards a social worker where we might be able to get additional support without a cost as opposed to a school adjustment counselor. But on that point through the chair to Mr. Jack, um, are we, when we're talking about the school adjustment counselors, are you using line 339 and calling them <coughs> guidance professional adjustment counselors? In terms of? How do you codify them within the budget? I don't see a line for school adjustment counselors. I see a line for professional guidance professional adjustment counselors. I'll, I'll have to go back and, and, and give you that answer, but I believe they're going to, when we put new positions in, we've, you've, we've identified those. They're very clear. I don't know where the existing ones exist today. Okay. Where they're where they're being coded, but I will have that answer. Well, I'm, I'm going to assume that that's the, the yeah. line that we're operating under, and there's presently 5.4 FTEs um, in the 15-16 budget. <coughs> Whether we add two and make that six, uh, 7 .4 or 3, 8 point four, um, we're still not at one FTE per building, and I think that was Ms. Carpenter's um, hope if I heard her right at our last budget meeting, um, do we have, um, are we going to be able to identify what uh, FTEs each building is going to get firstly and secondly, if we're, if um, the superintendent's asking for one FTE at the Welch, regardless of whether it's a social worker or a school adjustment counselor, is the superintendent able to commit one FTE to the Welch? So, with respect, that's operational, and that would be determined by once you develop the budget um, where the greatest needs are um, to fill in the holes that we presently have. That would be determined by uh, my uh, meetings on Monday mornings. We go over these, these issues. Uh, Will would be involved in that. Kara would be involved in that. Charlie would be involved in that. And all of the principals would be involved in that. So it's a longer discussion. And I can't answer that right now. Um, one thing I can tell you is that we do have holes. Uh, we, have, we have times during the day that schools are uncovered uh, for school adjustment counseling. And those seem to be the times that kids have meltdowns. Um, and we don't have people readily available uh, to go where they need to go. One of the uh, discussionary points that we've already had about the uh, new school adjustment council at the middle school would be that that person would be a floater so that no matter where uh, a school may need somebody, if it's uncovered, that that person would be available to go there um, from their middle school assignment in the Eagles program. Uh, we, we think that will work. I've had that discussion with Will. We may not be able to do that, have to do that so much if we add two more school, that was based on adding one school adjustment counselor. This is now the possibility of adding three school adjustment counselors if we don't add the social worker and, and we make it a school adjustment counselor. We're going to be pretty close to full-time coverage. It's yeah. not going to be full-time, but it's going to be pretty close. Okay. Um, thank you. Through the chair. And by the way, I'm sorry. I, yeah. 
Um, a lot of the assignment of school adjustment counselors is based on individual child. Uh, you know, certain schools that we know are going to need coverage more and longer than other schools because of the number and the nature of the individual child that, that is assigned there. And that's another thing that we take into consideration. Sure. Um, so through the mayor to Dr. Levine, with regard to the a few of your A-list items, and, and I, I don't have an issue with most of them. I do have a, a question regarding some of the numbers that you're putting in there for them. So for example, the thera therapeutic program, uh, executive, I guess, is what's put the access. Um, you have them at $90,000. I'm looking at the line for therapeutic program staff right now, and there's two FTEs at $128,000, um, 64000 each. I'm just wondering what the, what, what's the, do you, do you really believe that that differential is necessary in order to? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, first of all, it's a uh, teacher, it's an, it's a paraprofessional, and it's um, benefits. So it's two different positions? It's a yeah, it would be a T, right. This, okay. If we're going to add a program, if we're going to add another classroom, yep. it's got to be fully established. And fully established means a teacher and a para. Okay. And that, we, that gives us a 12 student capacity. But not really. I mean, I think legally it's a 12 student capacity. Right. In reality, is that In reality it's, that's why we're adding another classroom. Right. Okay. So the same thing with my, my question with the teacher. For the deaf, and I actually had a chance to tour that program yesterday too. And I realized that there's a student leaving the McCarthy and going up to the Higgins, and they want to be able to have a, a, a teacher um, stay with that student to the extent that we were able to fund this position. Uh, but again, the differential between what the um, teachers make. So the line that I'm looking at for 342, which shows one FTE for a Deaf and hard of hearing teacher at 64447. That's without pennies. That's, that's without pennies. That's right. salary. So the 75 is an expectation that there'll be benefits right. associated with that. Yeah, not only that, but the um, we're not sure this is going to be a full time position yet. Uh, we're still working on that and working out whether or not we can get a uh, uh, have a, a teacher of the deaf to service the kids that we need to service without uh, going <coughs> full time. We may need only a point six. We may need a point eight. We're still um, massaging that. And we were having that conversation today, as a matter of fact. And thank you. And if it's all right at this point, uh, Mr. Mayor, can we ask uh, Mr. Busey to come forward and ask a few questions about the two A-list items that are all over, Mr. Busey? Clearly marked for his building. <coughs> gifts, any gifts you have would be appropriate at this point. <laughs> that are on Dr. Levine's A-list are um, for a culinary instructor, I believe, and also for a, what he's now called a building access attendant. It's, it's gone through a few different iterations as far as title, and that's all fine. Um, but if you don't mind talking about the culinary um, position first. So sure. If we, go, if we go way back in history at the Higgins, we, we had a lot of um, what we call exploratories. Uh, when we first opened as a middle school, including wood shop, metal shop, we had the Vogue programs, and the Vogue was at the Higgins. We used to send our kids to the Vogue programs as part of exploratory rotation. We had culinary at the time. We had consumer science. And we gradually, those got whittled away every budget season. Instead of taking academic teachers or foreign language, we would take away an exploratory class. And it got to the point where our exploratory classes aren't really that exploratory anymore. We still have art, music. We have a great performing arts program. But we've got, um, a lot of the times we've, we've built into exploratory, we've built in some reading classes, some math classes, some ELA classes. And we want to bring back that exploratory piece. And we had the opportunity with a new building to create um, a culinary position, which is really more of a nutrition position now. It, culinary is, um, it's, it's a hot position in terms of where kids are going in the marketplace. It's a very popular program at PBD High. And we see this as an opportunity to bring a position in that will tie into our health curriculum a little bit too with nutrition and to serve as a nice feeder to the high school and to give some uh, career 
and exploratory opportunities to our kids that I think we need to we need to improve a little bit in that area. So, thank you. So, um, you do. I don't know how you do what you do. I mean, at that building, it's it's an incredibly uh, diverse population and difficult most of the time. Um, and you do do a terrific job there, uh, as does your staff. So my my. I guess I want you to talk me into something, because I'm not necessarily opposed to um, adding an exploratory, and I think that there is a need for that. I, I agree with you. Um, why culinary? Is there is there a, a is that what the students are talking about? What they want? It is. is it's, a, it's it is a it is one of the most popular programs at certainly elective programs. I can't speak to <coughs> vocationally at the high school, but it is every single eighth grader. That's the class that they want to take at the high school. It is something that is, uh, it's a popular alternative path for education for kids too. When you look at the, the people that are out there in the culinary world that are succeeding, they didn't do well in school. Yeah. And to provide that opportunity for, for kids, and to, pro to provide that exploratory for a middle school kid, like I, this is a career, this is a place for us to go, this is an actual path that I might be able to go in, I, that is the next exploratory that I would bring on. And, and I've been thinking about this for seven years now, since the beginning of the, of the school project. Okay. So it is, it is something that, that uh, I think there's a passion for. So, through the mayor, if I may, um, do you have a, a, an estimate as far as how many students that you'd be able to service with a, with a culinary program? We would make it part of, well, we've been discussing how, exactly how, there are some parts of our exploratory program that pretty much every kid takes. We have. Um, our health engineering and design program right now, which is a quarter of, two quarters of health, a quarter of uh, technology engineering, and a quarter of graphic design. And just about every one of our kids in the building has that, and they rotate through for a quarter for each one of those. Our plan would be to figure out a way to have culinary be similar to that, or attach it to the health program and maybe move one of those art classes out. So we would probably have, um, I don't know what the number would be, but it would be greater than 50% of our kids would be taking that class. Okay, and if I'm hearing you right, there's a vocational component to this, is that? No, but the vocational component of, at the high school, the culinary program at the high school. Okay. We have worked with uh, Ms. Ferry at this point to develop the curriculum and to, to develop the supply list that we would need, and she is, and as are the other culinary teachers at the high school, supporting the creation of the program. But. There's no actual vocational tie-in at this point. Okay. Now, if I may move on to the building access attendant, um, this gives me a lot of concern and, and, and um, on a lot of levels. And, and from what I understand, I've had fairly lengthy conversations with Dr. Levine about this. Not so much for the need for a building access attendant, but um, the support that I think somebody in this position would need. If, if we're in the technology that I don't understand, and maybe um, the technology department can shed some light on that. From what I understand, there's gonna be some sort of machine or device in which a person who's entering the Higgins um, is going to produce a driver's license or an identification card or something, and that's gonna get uh, scanned or slid through a machine which is going to produce information that would either allow that person access or um, they would be denied access based upon the, the results of that. Is that, is that, fair? Is that accurate? I don't the, the, most, yeah, I would say it's mostly accurate. So the, the system we have, it's, um, it's called the Raptor, as a matter of fact, and it, it does do that. It takes someone's government-issued ID, whatever it is, right. and it's scanned, and what it, it all it, it ties into the uh, sex offender registry database at this point. The rest of it would be internal for us. So we would be able to put in any custody issues or any uh, restraining order issues or any uh, dismissed to the grandmother on Tuesday afternoon. And when that ID is scanned, that information comes up on the screen and that is the information that the person who is checking people in has. It doesn't, it wouldn't, uh, have something that comes up and says this person is denied, There, something may pop up on the screen that causes this person to then, the system actually allows this person, when, if this happens, it allows for a text message or an email to go to the appropriate person. So if there was someone coming in, depending on the level of the issue that there was, it might shoot a text message to the guidance counselor saying this person's here and wants to pick up 
uh, Sally, but it's not Tuesday, can you come down? And the, and the guidance counselor could come down, it's built right into the system. But it would, the system itself would not um, deny entry to anyone. It's still a human, right. it's still a right. human system. It doesn't have the technology at this point for it, at the door for the ID to say, we can't let this person in the, and not allow the door to be open. It's still a human piece that's, that's part of it. So what, what, what procedure or, or protocols do you have in place now? I mean, I know that the office location is going to be different in the new building. The office is closer to the sure. entry door. But what, what protocol do you have now for if someone were to come in the building um, and want access, I guess, beyond the office, which is... With similar, we check the ID of the person that's coming in, but it's a paper log where we write down someone's name as they come in, and it's not... We're able to look at a name and then reference any paperwork that we might have, but it's not an automatic system that um, would give us the information in a database that would, would be on a screen and it's not as, as fast as this system would be. It would, it would be working in the background while the person's signing it. And also what it does, this system also prints out the vis visitor badge that has the person's picture on it. And it's a little sticker in the picture and the time and the visitor wears that. The, basically what you're able to do is you check the ID, that the ID, the picture matches the person in front of you and the, the, that picture is on the, the ID badge that the person has. So it... Um, it, the process is similar to what we do now, but the technology allows for us to do it more quickly and uh, more efficiently. So, just for example, if, if let's say, um, a person entering the building had a restraining order on them and weren't permitted to be near that child um, now, and they walked into your building with paperwork from court where they might have just come from and have evidence that that order was vacated, um, your office or your staff would recognize that and, uh, or maybe co co contact uh, the school resource officer or some other support and, and then allow for whatever that person is permitted to do or not permitted to do to take place. Yep. And that process would be the same. You're saying that? Okay. The so, process would change. So it's not simply the um, a, a readout off a scan that's no. going to, there'll be other support and protocols in place that will allow for um, updates, if you sure, know, that might not be in the system. Exactly, and the scan allow the scan also allows us frequent visitors who would scan in, and you'd have their ID, you'd have their ID scanned in, and when someone comes in and they give their ID, and and someone that's been through many times before, it's going to be instant, right. instant uh, badge access into the building. So like our PTO people and think people who are in the building all the time, they wouldn't have to go through that process. Right. That yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackman. Mr. Miko? Uh, through the chair to um, Dr. Levine or to uh, Mr. Busey, um, on, the, um, on the bat, on the building access attendant, my only concern is when that ID is swiped um, and that person has not gained access, do we have a plan in place in case of an escalated conflict right there and then? Because as you said, um, presently they, they show an ID and you fill it out and there's a form but with this, it's instantaneous, and, and that's my only concern with having someone there at the desk. You know, that person is now not able to come into the building, and I'd like to see something in place to make sure if that escalates, you know, what can we do other than hitting 911 because it's, you know, it's right in front of you, it's happening. And so through the chair, that would be a combination of things, and that's a good question, Mr. Miko. One, one would be the appropriate person. Another would be the appropriate training of that person. And the third would be um, what I know that uh, Mr. Busey has already uh, talked to me about, and that is uh, that person getting in touch with uh, an administrator immediately to come down and take over the situation. So it's really not going to be the job of the person sitting at the desk to even de-escalate the situation or to continue the conversation. The job of the person at the desk will be to say, please wait, I'll get you someone who can help you. And that will hopefully end that issue, and then an administrator will be uh, immediately available. Okay. Yeah, if I could add to that. The system that we are getting allows us to set up it in such a way that if that did happen, there would be the system would immediately alert. So if let's say it's someone on the sex offender registry, it would immediately alert the administrators, the administrators in the building. It would alert Officer Colella, our school resource officer. It, that would happen immediately. Be, 
probably simultaneously to it coming up on the screen for the for the person at the desk. And that that system, as opposed to what we have now, where we have to call, we have to contact by radio, we have to do it in a way that, that is you know, uh, subtle enough so that not everybody knows what's going on. This is this is instantaneous. So that's that's thank you. Yeah. One other thing um, on the uh, culinary um, middle school position. So uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Busey. So that would be an elective position. Uh, for an elective class for students, and how many students again would, would benefit from that? Certainly greater than half of our students. And it, it's not really elective in that we don't we don't really have elective exploratories every, sure. except for band and chorus okay. uh, in our, our uh, technology, student technology assistance team. Most of the exploratories are scheduled into, into a kid's schedule okay. so that they get uh, a little, a taste of a little bit of everything. So that's the schedule that it would be part of. Chair of the committee, um, I think it's a, a great investment. Um, I think not only culinary, but eating disorders are such a major part of our uh, um, social world today. And to have this in place, I think it would really benefit, especially students at the middle school level. They're uh, they're in need of it, and um, I fully support it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olympia, uh, for the chair, uh, Mr. Busey. Uh, would you? The business uh, access attendant, would they be available after school hours? What's the, the time frame? And if not, what's the protocol for when school ends? We had it designed primarily as a school day position. Okay. Uh, we, have a, we have the ability in the office. When the school day is over, we have the ability in the office to do the same thing just from the office. Okay. And, and when there are not as many people in the building and it's just staff and me, then I, I can do that same Gotcha. job as they come into the building, but okay. I think we're looking at it primarily as a, as a school day. There may be events that are going on after the school day that we may want to either adjust the schedule of that person okay. or do something with, with flexibility so that we can have that, that person there depending on what's going on. But for the most, time, I think, the most part, I think we're looking at the school days. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Carpenter? Thank you. Um, through the chair, Mr. Busey, did you say it was called a Raptor system? The Raptor, yes. The Raptor. Yes. Um, so my question was, um, you said it will alert the proper person. What? How does that alert get to say you? Through what means? It's either a text message or an email. However, we have it set up. Okay. Do you know how much that system costs? Uh, I do not. It's part of the building project, so I'm not sure. It, it sounds wonderful. I'm just curious how much it costs if we, because we're doing the same thing at the high school. You check in, it's off. I think it's not as it's not as expensive as I would have thought it was. It's, it's um, I, I have the information back at school. I guess. Um, so initially, somebody would have to um, data entry all of that type of information. But the only thing that automatically comes up without us entering any information is the sorry, the sex offender. Correct. No um, quarries, no police records, no driving type of things. It's just sorry. It's just sorry. That's the it's the only national database I think that's available. Uh, and then the, the rest of it would be what we locally input into the system. And that could be any any kind of information that we want to have there. And I think it, instead of having to <coughs> rifle through to find an emergency form to see who's on it, it would be it would be right there. What a great resource. Yeah, it really, it really is. Yeah, that really is good. Um, through the chair, Mrs. Dunn, do you have any idea how much it costs? Being on the building committee? No. I, I actually do not know what that, that system goes for. Just in the future, uh, Dr. Levine, if we could look into, see how much it costs. Throw the chair. Techie boys. <laughs> I don't know. We, we actually just very recently <clears throat> learned about the Raptor system in a meeting we had about a week ago, so that, that's entirely new to us. But okay. I mean, if we can assist with. We'll, we'll find that out. I can find that out by phone call. Yes, we're essentially doing the same thing at the high school. Yeah. So I, have, I, have the, I just have okay. with people. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it to you tomorrow. I'll get it out to you tomorrow. And, to, and through the chair, if I could, you referred to the technology department by its old name. Uh, <laughs> it is now known as the Techie Boy Department. Um, this, this, by the way, is, is uh, done in many high schools now, uh, this system. Danvers High School um, has the system in place. Uh, and almost every new high school that's been built in the last 10 years has a system similar to this. It just. Um what do we do if they don't have a license or an ID? We're just going back to the regular old-fashioned way. They, is that person still going to have access, um, the building access attendant? No. They'll still be able to process with a, picture, with a picture ID, without a picture ID now, we, we're, we are not allowing anybody to either take anyone or come into the building. They, you need a government-issued picture ID to do that. That's, That's pretty consistent with private buildings now also.
I wouldn't know. I always have my picture ID, so I don't know, I don't know what they However, do. However, that's where the, the frequent visitors come in because you'll have their picture on the screen and you'll have the person standing in front of you so, so you'll you're be able to do that. So it starts to... Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carpenter. This is done. Then, Mr. Rodko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Busey, thank you very much for the explanations. I was trying to explain the culinary program in light of uh, home ec. <laughs> so you did it. You did it proud. You, you really explained it very well. And um, I'm very glad that, that Higgins is going to have the culinary classroom. Um, one of the things that we noticed in a lot of the new buildings that are going up for middle schools, they are including culinary classrooms in those buildings. And it's really something that's, um, it, it, it's tied in with nutrition and health and science. It can be used in so many different ways. It, it is an important class for students at that age. So I'm very glad that you're, uh, you know, that you're doing that and, and making sure that the students do get that exposure to being able, it's a life skill learning how to, to, to cook and how to cook nutritionally and how to be safe in the kitchen. There are so many lessons that they will be able to provide to the students that um, it really is, a, 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 it's going to be a great program, but it's a great idea to bring it back. So thank you. And um, with the building access attendant, I, I will just say I am very much in support of that. I think it's, it's, it's a very good feature of the security of the building. In this day and age, everyone is worried about security, and this is an attempt to make sure that that building is able to run smoothly presently. You have office staff doing a lot of different things at once. This person is going to be dedicated to screening the people who come in the building and being able to contact the appropriate people so that someone comes down and can escort that person to wherever they're supposed to be in the building. So I think it's a very important piece of, of the New Higgins and uh, it's going to help greatly with many different issues that we, we face every day in the buildings now. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Thanks. I'll be brief. Um, I'm absolutely in support of the culinary teacher. I think that you hit the nail on the head as far as it being a feeder system for the high school. That's, I think, what we're really trying to institute at the Higgins is more feeder programs into our already established high school programs. So any more that we could add, photography, visual arts, anything else that we can kind of continue on that path, I'd be all in favor of. Because when you get to high school, you're sometimes limited. But if you already have a taste of it at the middle school level, it's just something that you can grow a passion for. So that one I'm absolutely 100% on board with. The building access or bat or attendant or whatever we're calling it right this second. Um, it's only $20,000, so I'm not going to believe or the point drastically. But you said they're already doing it now. And this system will actually make it easier. So why we need a new position for something that's already being done and handled in an archaic manner compared to what it's going to be handled next year, I don't see the benefit. But I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rosigal. Any other uh, comments, questions? Mr. Hartman? One of the, the since students see us here for their representatives, are you uh, anticipating that the building access attendant would be a member of Unit C? And you would develop some sort of no, um, no. oh no 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 it's actually uh, not a member of any unit. Oh, it's like security. He's uh, oh. similar to the security at the high school. Okay, and since after that to the mayor, uh, since I'm not hearing much by way of my colleagues in terms of objections to um, Dr. Levine's A list, and we're seventy-five thousand dollars apart between what he's projecting and what you are offering. Um, we may be able to get through something fairly quickly, it sounds like, if, if we're able to bridge that shortfall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, no, I, 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 my thoughts, and, and you guys have all articulated them very well, I, um, I wasn't sure about the social work. I didn't know if a school adjustment council would be better there. The only other one that I, I did like to was the... Uh, the K through 12 director director of curriculum and instruction. Um, I thought with the science um, 
new science curriculum being rolled out this year, and then we're looking at maybe social, social studies. studies the following year. Um, you know, I thought that might be a worthy investment as well, but I certainly would defer to the, the um, a superintendent, assistant superintendent, and, and all of you as to what's the the, uh, the item. But certainly, if if we're narrowing it down, or maybe looking at the school adjustment council instead of a social worker, uh, I'd be ready to, to meet to meet that number, the one point eight two five. Um, so there we go. There we have it. That sounds good. Let's do it. Okay. Have to make a motion. <laughs> um, just may I ask uh, before you make a motion and Quick, thank you very Jesus much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want the other eight. Can we get the other eight? <laughs> would, you, would you finalize the A list for me, please, um, and uh, just make a uh, a motion since I've I've given you the social work. Would somebody move to uh, switch that out for another school adjustment council so that I have that directive? Are, are yeah. you on that point? Yeah. Can you? Uh, I mean, the only, if I may, I haven't been recognized. Nobody has. <laughs> 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 Don't let anybody talk. Let's just vote. <laughs> Roll call. Um, <laughs> I vote Mr. Hockman and Mr. Rosenthal. Yeah, no. I think thank, thank, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the only, I, I hear you a lot of clear, Ms. Carpenter, in terms of the School Adjustment Council, and I agree that we, we need as many as we can get. Um, the only added benefit that I see with, with a social worker is being able to get some interns and some additional people in the building who would be able to help. And I think that Dr. Levine and Mr. Rubitz, will, um, after consultation, will commit a one FTE to the Welch because there's a, right, there's a, there's a need for someone there full time. Um, but I think that with a licensed social worker being able to have two or three interns um, to assist in that population, may just benefit us. And, and maybe if we could look at that for a year and if that doesn't work, move to a school, uh, school adjustment counselor. I see, I had direct conversations on this very subject yesterday with, with the therapeutic program at the West and, and she would just, you know, was talking about how it enabled her to do other things while in the building and interns were present and you know she had direct super, you know supervision of them not you know full contact with them but supervision of them I just kind of see that there's an added benefit in maybe reaching more kids with a with a social worker. Mr. Rosino I said you would be next. Um, I, I'm kind of along the same lines of thinking as uh, Mr. Hockman. I, I just want to make sure we maximize our bang for our buck if that means getting students from Salem State in conjunction with a social worker so we're getting more bodies for the same price tag, I'd be all for that. If that's not the situation, then I just want to make sure that kids are getting serviced. And I just want to make sure we maximize the services that they're getting, whether it's through the school adjustment council or through a social worker. Mrs. Dunn and Mrs. Company. Thank you, Smith. The expansion of the therapeutic program um, we know that we need to do that. Also, if I'm, if I'm not correct, please correct me, but there are many students from the Welch in the therapeutic program. Is, is that still the case? It was when it first opened. I, w I wouldn't say many. Okay. Uh, no, I wouldn't say many. Okay, then, then I'm sorry. Um, okay. that, that, that answered my question. Thank you. Uh, that service is a different population than what a social worker might serve, for mm -hmm. example or even a school adjustment council. They're, they're at a different level. Okay. All right. when, it, when it first opened, it was yeah. a little bit different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different level. Okay. okay. Mrs. Um, to the point about the, the social worker, my thought on that is, if we switch that out for a school adjustment counselor, because all of our schools need more school adjustment counselors, we'll be able to service more of them because what we're doing is we're spreading them around on an as-needed basis. In my opinion, the school adjustment counselor, by having more of them, will be able to identify more children who will need a social worker. And I think that the families are able to still get that social worker on their own by being referred, but they're not able to get the school adjustment counselor until we fully staff all of the schools with them. So my thought is, 
they can get that social worker. They can't get the school adjustment counselor. And, and that's where I'm asking for it to be switched. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Mika. Through the chair of the committee, um, I'm actually torn on that. Um, hearing Mr. Hockman speak at one point, I said, oh, I'm thinking, yes, a social worker. And now with uh, Mrs. Ms. Carpenter speaking, I'm thinking maybe the uh, school adjustment counselor. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that I think we need both. And if we do have a buffer, um, maybe in the summer, a cushion, maybe we can uh, <laughs> more if the mayor would like. I mean, he gave it pretty easily there after $80,000 more. I don't know how to do it right now. But I I'm just saying that hopefully, um, whichever way we decide, that if there is a buffer in the summer, we definitely need either another school adjustment counselor or another social worker, and um, in addition to the maybe one or two teachers that you had alluded to. But that, that's how I feel on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. One of the things that a social worker does is they they uh, find appropriate resources for a person, correct? Perhaps there is a way that we would be able to help the elementary school guidance counselors to have a resource bank where they are better able to access those services that a social worker would, would be steering them to. Um, the school adjustment counselors, to my understanding, they help they help the students who are not on an IEP because they have not been diagnosed, but they still need services. I mean, it's a very simple way to explain it, but well, school it's from the chair. School adjustment councils actually um, help both, but they do help special ed students. Right. It's a special ed position, mm -hmm. actually. Oh, okay. So, so they're servicing that. Right. Correct. Right. But they, they're able to help. They are able to help others. Yeah. Well, yeah, they they are, but they they're not locked into just special ed. Okay. But but their primary role, I mean, it's hard to deny a kid who need might need hit their services right. just because they're not on special ed because they might eventually be on. Uh, but for the most part, their role is to service the special ed population. The guidance counselor, on the other hand, services the gen ed population. Right. And. A social but, worker but may not have. The, I'm sorry to interrupt. The, no, no, the, okay. to, to finish the thought, the, the guidance counselor may not have the depth of skill to help the student the way a, uh, uh, um, a SAC might have. Right. They they have different roles. They have different roles. But a guidance counselor could be able could be able to help in many of the ways that a social Absolutely. worker could. And, and so, does. And, and does, yeah. right, because, I mean, I'm, I'm going back to a time where we had a half-time guidance counselor, and then we got a full-time guidance counselor at the elementary level in one school. And then we eventually ended up being one of the only school districts in, the, in, in anywhere in the state at the time to have a full-time guidance counselor in every elementary school. It has helped greatly. And if we can give them some more tools, help them to be able to advocate for the students in the building a little bit more. A social worker would definitely be doing that exclusively, but our guidance department, not to put more on the guidance department, because they they have a lot on their plate as it is. Um, and, and that's something I'd like to bring up later on, not for this budget, but I can envision someday where we have an office of testing. And the job of those people will be to administer all the tests that go on in the system because right now that's what the guidance counselors are doing and it's a it's an it's an abuse of their talents seriously if we can lessen the testing that they deal with they would be able to do a lot of the things that social worker would do Thank you. If, if this would help um at this point in the discussion i think i would favor a school adjustment counselor at this point and the reason for this is i think that uh, hearing your discussions um, and knowing where we're going regarding um, school adjustment counseling, this would almost lock up our need for school adjustment counselors and would provide um, some of the services that a social worker might provide anyway because it will provide more on-site help for kids directly. And I think Mrs. Dunn makes a good point that we do have guidance counselors who provide a a tremendous service for our kids and families now at each school that would work hand in hand with the school adjustment counselor. We can work on social work. You'll see this in the next budget. Um, but I think at this point, um, for those of you who are on the fence, and listen, it's, it, 
it's a it's a no lose situation as far as I'm concerned. Um, I would think that maybe maybe go with the school adjustment counselor this year in place of the social worker, and um, we'll address the uh, need for social work next year. That's just my recommendation. Mr. Rosigno, then Mr. Olympia. I'll be brief. I just want to commend this board. When I first got on, one of the first things I think we did was to cut sacks. Yeah. <laughs> so, and part of that was the timing and budget and money. And um, it's amazing how six, seven years later, we are realizing the error of our ways and we're kind of correcting a situation that we, believe it or not, put ourselves in. With the assistance of Ms. Metropolis. Yeah. yeah. She was a big advocate. Absolutely. So I, I just I just want to applaud this board, your leadership, Mr. Mayor, um, you giving us the funding, obviously, just to do the right thing. So that was just my two cents. Thank you, Mr. Lupia. Yeah. Through the chair, I I agree with Ms. Carpenter. She put it well, and I would agree with the recommendation from the superintendent. Okay. Mrs. Carpenter. Um, with all of that being said. Um, I just want to add, I firmly believe by adding the SAC, we're going to be able to service more students. We can spread them around more. But I would uh, like to make a motion to accept the superintendent's uh, recommended budget proposal, including the A list and swapping out item 10, social worker for a school adjustment counselor. Second. Thank you for the motion by Mrs. Carpenter, seconded by Mrs. Dunn. Any further comments? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Mr. Hawkins? Yes. Mr. Roosevelt? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Mr. Rosenthal? Yes. Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Olympia? 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 Yes.